multiple. I guess it depends on we're talking about the trolley problem for anyone listening. It depends on, you know, how hardcore you want to be. If it's like if it's one loved one, one stranger, I think 99 percent of people would probably go for the loved one, wouldn't they? But if it's like 10 strangers and one loved one now, now what do you do? <laughs> so I wonder yeah. if everyone has a certain number. I, I guess that's in the movie we're about to start talking about. So uh, I don't know. I guess the, we'll just jump on into it. Um, if I'm a little wackier today, I maybe because of the weather, I didn't set an alarm because usually I wake up, uh, th it's currently 8.30, and I usually wake up like 6.30 or 7 just naturally, right? And um, today I woke up, oh, it must be like 7. I look at the clock, it's 8.04. That was 25 minutes ago, so. <laughs> okay. And I've take, I may, may have taken too much DayQuil today because i was hallucinating a little bit earlier so that's good for this I'm, movie. I'm back now but i didn't even realize <laughs> yeah it was it was partly from this movie yeah <laughs> okay let me do an intro and let's let's get into it then hello welcome to the occult disney podcast where we look for the magic inside the mouse and then throw him into a black cauldron of death and see what happens with that mouse or a dog as happens in today's movie the black cauldron or big or a pig, yeah. You can throw a pig in, too, if you want. This is Matt here. As always, joining me is Thomas, the Paranoid American. Howdy. Paranoid as ever. Do we say uh, paranoid? Do we say howdy in, in Florida? Is, is is that still howdy land? I haven't heard howdy in a, in a while. I lived in Texas, too. I didn't even hear it that often in Texas, but you did hear it once in a while. Okay, I throw that out. I also throw out uh, groovy a lot, so um, especially that just in Japan. you. In Japan, that becomes confusing. Although I can say that the Japanese equivalent seems to be Naoi. So Naui. if I that's a Japanese word from like the seventies, and if I say it to a kid, they'll have no clue what I'm saying. So um, I guess maybe I date myself when I just call things like cool and awesome, and bodacious and radical. Okay, the first I'm down with the first two. Maybe not down with the second two. Okay. Um, <laughs> Don't yeah, yeah, man. Today's movie is 1985, so I guess that's prime bodacious time. Um, it is. A movie long in gestation. Production on this, they bought the rights for the books in 1973, got to work on it a little bit, and moved on to The Rescuers. That became the main focus. Did that. Um, then went that made this their main focus again, and then realized it was going to take a long time. And uh, did The Fox About and the 15 Hound. 15 years or so. <laughs> did, yeah, yeah, yeah. This came out in 1985, so that's a 12-year turnover, which is is pretty wild um this came out when i was six do you, do you remember this uh when it was released no i mean i, I was born in 83 so oh, yeah you're really little, just been a not... couple years i remember seeing it a few times but it never really registered as much so when i was re-watching it i mean I've, I've watched it a few times in adulthood but uh it's it doesn't ever like kind of trigger those nostalgia factor that i'm used to with so many other disney movies this one didn't have as much of it for me. See, I got a lot of the ephemera or whatever. Like, I, I, I'm, I feel like I got to know this movie through like Burger King glasses or something. Maybe McDonald's. <laughs> I'm, I'm not quite sure which, or even if that actually happened or if I'm just making it up. I'm not quite sure. But I remember like you know some of the marketing. I um at six, I'm pretty sure my parents like might have like declined taking me to see it because it was you know the first Disney movie. It was supposed to make you poop yourself or whatever. Although Fantasia and Sleeping Beauty certainly have those moments. Um, <laughs> uh, Pinocchio is still scarier in my mind. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Good point. Good point. That, that was... scene from Pinocchio is way scarier than any scene in this entire movie. Sorry, I was just listening. To, I didn't watch the 2022 Pinocchio. But I just listened to people do a podcast about it and kind of, yeah. Well, I'm talking about the, cla the original No, I, I, I know you are. Yeah. I know you are. I just, uh, I have them talking about the new one on the mind where everything I've, I've seen both new garbage. ones. The one with Hanks and the, uh, the, the, um, Del Toro. Yeah. Del Toro. The... Yeah. That one's supposed to be good, right? I mean, maybe it's not. I don't know, but uh, way better than the Hanks one. Yeah. You can just skip, <laughs> you can just skip the Hanks one in my opinion. Yeah. I, I could imagine. So, um, other things I do remember from this time is watching this movie. I was surprised how many He-Man vibes I got because I was watching a lot of <laughs> He-Man in 1985-86. Uh, the castle looks a lot. And, and again, I'm sure it's not like they were ripping off He-Man. It's just the same minds or maybe it had a same anime or two that, you know, jump ship. But uh, yeah, it looks, the castle looks like Grayskull. You know, the horned god almost looks like Skeletor, you know? I mean, um, you're not wrong, man. I, I didn't put like those Prince together, Adam. but... 
yeah 100 percent. like the the whole like the magical sword and fighting off the skeleton army and the castle gray skull it's funny because this does predate he-man by so much but i almost feel like he-man is the far superior magical sword animation yeah um well although i'll give this one that you know taran i'm gonna say the same by the way i'm gonna boy I'm going to be garbage, pig boy. I'm going to be garbage on the names of this because I was like a little worried. Like, am I going to be remember? Am I going to be remember? Am I going to remember his name properly? And then I looked at everyone else's name and we're sticking with the pig, the princess. Um, Guggy, I can do that because I thought it was Dougie, but it's it's with G's, so I can handle that. I can handle I think the it's Gurgi, but Gurgi. it's going to get even worse because some of the original mythology this is based on is wealth. <laughs> a welsh mythology and i can't even say the word welsh uh easily <laughs> let alone the words that they used so this is going to be a fun sort of butchering oh yeah i'm glad i tend to cover the production and then <laughs> but yeah i was looking over the plot and i was like oh my god these names what the even in the movie she was like i'm princess blah, blah, blah. i'm like what <laughs> <laughs> I'm my, yeah, you- my original look through what because because usually when we watch these movies i'll watch the whole thing um, sort of like unscathed. I, I stopped doing like the ahead research because I didn't want to ruin my movie watching experience first. But this one, yeah, I just wrote down like Dalben. And even though his first name isn't necessarily hard, it's it's a uh, Kara Dalben. But the way that they say it in the movie, it's like, wait, did did I mishear it? Did they not record the whole thing? Like, what words are they using? So yeah, that this is a, a interesting movie too because they move so fast and there's not as much repetition that I'm used to with the Disney movies where they kind of hammer it into you over and over. This one is just like they'll just keep dropping new names on you. Yeah, it it, it is of a piece. I think, despite being started in the mid '70s, it does seem of a piece of a lot of the um, mid '80s fantasy movies. Like you feel a little labyrinth in here. I mean, th- oh, this yeah. movie could have used some David Bowie, but any movie could use some David Bowie. Um, <laughs> uh, I felt like, you know, a little bit of like something like Legend or something. Uh, Tim Curry as his own horned god, hor- horny god. I, in that I have to say that you're you're nailing this on the head right now because this movie has the aesthetic and the vibe of the movie that it should have been. And it, and it reminds me of so many other cooler uh sort of execute i don't want to say ip because the original ip is actually really good the chronicles of predame but this movie in particular the aesthetic kind of outshined the actual storytelling in a way disney's version of the storytelling oh yeah for for sure um the one the main reason i'm really not sure if i've seen this before is i may be thinking of the video game dragon slayer (laughs) Yeah, well, it has a very similar style to. Um, of course, that was another Don Bluth uh, creation, right? Um, and Space Ace, but, uh, Space Ace. Yeah, I don't think you'd probably confuse uh, Space Ace with Black Cauldron as easily. Uh, but this, I don't know. I I think that uh, there's something to be said about even like the original um storyline and and like that 1980s aesthetic of this, you know, magical swords and fighting off skeleton creatures and stuff it's not as much dragon's lair but dragon's lair absolutely had that like mystical they, they almost had like a, a castle gray skull aspect to it as well and i don't i don't know if they all came from the same source uh or if it was just you know a whole bunch because i guess king arthur legends the arthurian legends which we'll get into that actually is the source of some of these characters like for example henwen the pig is rumored to be the mother of this like magical evil black cat that ends up killing King Arthur in some Welsh renditions of the Arthurian uh, legends. So, and I'm not by any means an expert on any of that, but it was just interesting to see like how far it kind of goes back. And there's lots of like even um, Dragon's Lair. That's essentially a reference to you know King Arthur in some sort of tangent. Yeah, um, I do remember seeing that game. You know, we still, you know, 80s arcade, right? Strange, prime Stranger Things sort of stuff. Um, but watching... It wasn't a great game. I don't know if you've ever no, played it in the arcade. No, I was about to explain. Uh, like, like, I remember watching it a lot. Like, maybe just looking at the demo, right? And not being able to understand what the deal was. Maybe playing it once or twice and not and instantly failing. But mostly either just watching it run or watching somebody else play it. And probably fail too because it was basically an unplayable game. <laughs> it, yeah, no, it's it was game in the most uh, technical sense of the word, but all it really was was just uh, quick actions. You'd have to hit a button 
at the exact moment in order to, to like keep the movie playing. Just imagine someone putting the Black Cauldron on and then doing like a Simon Says. And if you didn't get it right, they'd stop the tape and rewind it five minutes and start over again. That's essentially <laughs> Dragon's Lair. <laughs> And you pump your quarters into it, of course. So, well, yeah, yeah, that's right. That's the the biggest part of it. I mean, hey, you but like, watch... I don't think people were gathered around the Dragon's Lair machine, like, oh, you know, Bobby over here, he's a Dragon's Lair master. All you really got to do at that point was essentially watch the Dragon's Lair movie, which it kind of should have been, right? Yeah. Well, I think people were gathering around the machine a little bit at first, though, but that's because it looked so good, right? Because everything right, else right, was right. was you know like uh, what was the best in eighty five video games was. Well, all those were Burner way out, more yeah. based. I mean, we're talking like Pac-Man, Invaders, yeah, yeah, uh, Centipede kind of stuff. But that that's also because those graphics were being generated dynamically, and you know, um, through like the code a little bit more so, or li- like bitmaps sometimes, like little sprite sheets. Whereas this uh, Dragon's Lair and Space Ace, they you know completely turned that on its head. They looked amazing for the time. You know, they almost look like Laserdisc esque, I guess, way before, you know, decades before. Right. Um, for, for this movie, though, uh, Dragon Slayer looks good. Of course, you got Bluth there. I, the Black Cauldron, though, yeah, like the animation, I, this, I felt like this might actually be the best animation in a Disney movie. Like, I was getting my mind blown, like, sort of how, like, you know, Fantasia or, uh, Snow White did again. Like, it, they had that level of detail in this movie, which I've, been not complaining but noting that the past several movies have not so well and that actually actually uh brings up uh an interesting note that i realized when watching this and that's the not every disney movie but whenever disney works on a new type of animation process and i think this was technically I, I, like their first computer animated or you know a man assisted. in the chair for you on that in a moment <laughs> Okay, you can you can do the part. But the the interesting part of this is that a lot of these Disney movies as they open up, they tend to show their level of technology and how they deal with like parallax movement. So they'll like on the very earlier movies, um we would kind of see maybe like four to five to six different planes, but it was very obvious at some points when it was just the camera kind of zooming in and you saw that cellophane or like you know the 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 drawn cells kind of getting closer farther away. They could add like a little bit of a blur effect to it and then as it goes they'll make it a little bit more complex so in black cauldron in the opening scene the same thing they're doing this like this slow you know zoom in and you can see the foreground and the background there's at least like oh, i'm just gonna throw a number but it's like there's eight or nine different levels but the way that they're zooming it and as they pan left and right it almost looked like a like a really awesome point and click adventure game that you would have seen in maybe like the mid nineties or something with like lots of different planes and parallax movement. So Monkey I just thought Island. that was really cool. It, it gave such a weird vibe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, space quest. I played those Kings. I played Kings quest a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Space quest was my jam. So <laughs> yeah, um, it, it, I almost wanted it to turn into like a classic Sierra point and click game. <laughs> once that, that intro started opening up Um, as far as animation, as with, many burgeoning technologies uh most of this was still done with xerox machines they still use them a lot uh they didn't have caps yet because this movie looks like it used caps right almost uh it's called apt animation photo transfer process uh as said here it would enhance the technology which blah blah first the, an- the rough animation would be photographed onto high contrast lithographic film and the resulting negative would be copied onto the plastic cell sheets that would transfer lines and the colors which eventually eliminated the hand inking process i don't really know what i just said because i'm you know i'm not deep in animation <laughs> but it's uh something a little different uh, there are a few computer animated elements here the cauldron itself i believe is uh early cg uh, some of that green mist and stuff is is CG. So th- this is actually I feel cool. like it was done well. No, nothing stood out as uh, dating itself in terms of effects and animation. I don't think. I mean, obviously, it's got the '80s aesthetic that we were talking about, mm. but it do- it definitely didn't have that same crude uh, Xerox look. The 101 Dalmatians. Every once in a while, it looked like someone just showed you something that had been copied in the office copier like 80 times. Like you'll see a dog under a couch somewhere and it's still got like, you know, dirt and specks all around it. Felt like either the technology had advanced quite a bit since then or that they just spent a lot more time cleaning this one up. 
Yeah, I think they well, yeah, they had a lot of time to make this movie, <laughs> but they yeah, fifteen um, years, right? You know, you you use that process in the parts where specifically no one's going to notice it because it's still easier and cheaper, and then you use your newer techniques when you know, like you have an orb of light, right? You can't really get away with a glowing orb of light with uh, that kind of technique. You actually do need a computer for that. So it is a pretty, I, I like that. I like cobbling together like several methods. And again, um, if, if this movie like had a little bit more of a compelling, you know, drive to it, it might be one of the best Disney movies. Um, I, I will say, I, I think I brought it up before the, uh, the old, tokyo disneyland attraction that was in the castle and uh included the horned god because it premiered in 1986 and uh, i think it was there for tw 22 years and uh I, I did go to it once and it was legitimately terrifying there were kids screaming and stuff uh, at the the tokyo disney attraction yeah, i'm it, jealous that sounds all i would have loved to have seen the horned god attraction at a, <laughs> at a disney world and then one kid is uh they get one kid to you know get the sword and and i think i want to say they have an animatronic dragon for that but uh i mean there are there are clips on youtube you that you can see but yeah it's definitely one of those like you know you have to be there sort of things uh li living here I, i've i've watched the rise of the resistance ride throughs but i'm sure i have not experienced it so you know sometimes you just got to go <laughs> i wonder how open disney would be to mashups of their own material because it would have been so cool to have some sort of combination of sword in the stone and the black cauldron but just imagine that instead of this wimpy kid turning into a fish and always running away they go and they battle the horned god uh That's with kind you know, of what this attraction did except uh, you know as a japanese kid but uh, <laughs> well i guess it wasn't always they could they could have other volunteers as well sure you know it's a very international crowd at tokyo <laughs> disneyland <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to see if I can find a bit more to, to say about that attraction because it is the only, I think it's the only themed attraction for, for the Black Cauldron. <laughs> and uh, did they ever have one of those in the States or was that exclusive to Japan? It was exclusive to Japan. Um, Black Cauldron, Tokyo Disney. But yeah, I can't, yeah. I can't, I'm trying to think of the scariest Disney World uh, attraction. I, uh, this I don't know be, if there's anything I mean, that's bad. World, yeah. But, yeah. Well, this... yeah, World, yeah. Maybe the Pirates Caribbean or something. Yeah, that, that doesn't really do it, does it? <laughs> Disneyland, Black Culture, Disneyland. Let's see what I can find on that. Um, scariest attraction. Hmm. Oh, that's right. We talked oh, about this before. Alien the, the Alien Encounter. Yeah, yeah I, that one. Okay, I think Alien Encounter actually like wins wins the prize for that. So, oh, it's called the Cinderella. Castle. Maybe although man, it wasn't as scary as it was like uh, Jack in the Box type of stuff. It was like pop scare. It wasn't. It was the Horn God ride, uh, Jack in the Box type scares, or was it more of like the entire experience was terrifying? It was a walkthrough. Um, it was not an actual ride, and it's this very unassuming door on the side of the castle. It just says Cinderella Castle Mystery Tour mystery tour what's that like i went in not knowing what it was right this is uh this was like 2000 oh so it wasn't even advertised as black cauldron or anything no not at all it's the cinderella castle mystery tour tour guide leads the guest into a gallery starts talking about heroes and hero heroines uh you see tar on, on the walls the magic mirror appears feeling insulted that the villains have been put down and explains that no hero is complete without a villain the paintings transform into the villains um the mirror opens a door that sends you into basically a dungeon. You've got a witch's laboratory, howling bats staring at the guests, uh, a book with a recipe for a poison apple, uh, a dark passage in dungeon. Uh, where, where do we get? We go past prison. So, so it basically turns into a uh, haunted house, but not like a haunted mansion one, but like an actual haunted house uh, for a while. Uh, Chernabog comes up next using footage from Fantasia to show him summoning the spirits. Okay, so that's that's there to terrify you too. Maleficent's goons show up. Uh, they're in every corner. Uh, you see her castle. Oh, and then you see the tapestries for the Black Cauldron. Once upon a time, the world was ruled by evil. The Horned King, the evil lord, used the Black Cauldron to blah, blah. Um, and what, do we fight a dragon at the end? Okay, the horn. You're describing what sounds like the the coolest Disney experience that I've never been able to partake in. It was and you cool. had the crazy Dumbo ride, which I'm jealous about too. <laughs> you mean Winnie the Pooh? Or sorry, the Winnie the yeah the surreal Winnie the Pooh ride. Yeah, you should be <laughs> you should be jealous of that. 
Um, just okay. So the Horn King proceeds to awaken the Cauldron Born, threatening to kill the guests. <laughs> he is the Cauldron to make them join his army. Just then, the special guest, the, the kid they choose, uh, points the sword of light towards the Horn King and using its power defeats the villain and his army by blasting them with a powerful bolt of light. And the hero's goodness triumphs, which seems a little wrong that we're using the sword to defeat the villain and end the thing, the experience, because. You know, that's kind of a MacGuffin in this movie, right? The the whole point is he doesn't need the sword. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's a good point. All they well, all they really have to do is just destroy the cauldron, essentially. Right, exactly. L- that's little the, Lord that's of the, the Rings, point. I guess, too, yeah, but... very Lord of the Ringsy. <laughs> but uh yeah, I mean I I guess it was deflected a little bit, but you know, the, the experience is in Japanese, so I was taking my, my girlfriend at the time or I was there with my girlfriend at the time so she's like whispering translations in my ear while while all this terrifying stuff is happening <laughs> <laughs> so that that you know when you have a, a a Japanese lady like giving you translating in your ear kind of like I guess takes down the uh, fear factor a bit but yeah yeah I could see again the the entrance to this is so unassuming and then the the experience becomes so terrifying and it's a walkthrough which somehow makes it also seem more terrifying if you're in a ride vehicle you have like you know, you got your doom buggy, you got your, your insulated, right? But here you just got to walk through it. <laughs> I like it, man. I'm, I'm just, and when did you say that one closed? 2008, I believe. It might have been six. Oh, wow. That's that's fairly recent then. Yeah, There's yeah, probably there. some YouTube footage of someone going through the whole thing now. I I believe I watched it. Uh, I, I don't know if it's Defunct Clan. It might be Yesterworld, but one, one of them has a video about it. So people can definitely, you know, look up Cinderella Castle Mystery Tour and then find a pretty cool probably a vhs video but you know you can watch it <laughs> so that's probably the closest thing to a black cauldron attraction in a disney park it was the inclusion of it in that little walking tour plus some maleficent in a uh, chernobog apparently so right yeah. <laughs> just to make it you know full full crap yourself factor so um <laughs> i mean if you tell me there's a chernobog ride somewhere i'm all in well uh, like i said it's just a bit of footage but he sees there right so yeah <laughs> Yeah, if you had a full-on uh, bald mountain ride, that'd be cool. So, but I mean, when when we get into the occult aspects and everything, if if you want to go with the thread that Disney was casting an actual spell in Fantasia, that Chernobog scene is them tapping into one of like the oldest archetypes. And when they see it, say evil runs the world, it's I guess in my mind, it's not necessarily that the entire world was evil. It was just that black magic was so much more accessible and and nature magic was way more accessible than i don't know what you would consider good magic everyone would have their own version maybe it's like a john d enochian style magic where you're talking to angels that uh want you to swap your wives or something but uh, i i feel that when they say evil magic when you bring up chernobog and you bring up the horned god in particular what you're really talking about is ancient um nature magic and sort of sympathetic magic that that dealt with you know sacrifice and rebirth and and things of this nature yeah i mean if we see fantasia sort of like casting the spell for for disney success you you have to return to all elements of that spell at certain points and the last time they'd really hit this particular vibe probably was sleeping beauty um and and even that i guess was a much much cuter way although i did feel like the fairies in this were were kind of like you know sleeping beauty fairy babies so <laughs> And we got to throw in too. Uh, Legend of Zelda fits into this '80s archetype with magical swords and fairies, and it was a it was a great time, man. I don't I don't know if if I guess it was probably the tail end of the '70s too, like '70s going on '80s. There was a resurgence in uh, Lord of the Rings, and I think just like in general, like the the whole adventure thing became kind of mainstream for a while. Yeah, well, it's not like Zelda's died down. I had to cut out like five days of podcasting were blacked out because my my two main co-hosts oh that's right the new one just came out right? they were like we are playing tears of the kingdom for five days do not bother us <laughs> <laughs> so um i mean i'm sure i didn't i don't have the time for that but <laughs> yeah uh i'm sure it's fun if, if you got a switch and, and on and all that the, the last zeldas i played were the ones on the ds which apparently are the worst ones so whatever <laughs> I don't know. I, I did buy a few because um, we have a I, I've been getting my daughter into like old stuff. Um, we have a Wii, not a Wii U, a Wii. So you can go to the used stores and get like, you know, I got like the two Wii games that were on um, 
the two Zelda games that were on the Wii for like three bucks a piece. Uh, so she's been playing them. Uh, I got a I got a message a few days ago. She she finally wanted to borrow some CDs. I was excited about that, which was uh, what was it? Aerosmith, Bruno Mars, and the band Sugar. I was like, okay, that's cool. Those circular <laughs> plastic things. Yeah. Hey, I'm, I'm I just um the rental store I talked about near my house finally closed. And uh, they sold off the last day they were open. They sold off all their Blu-ray for like a buck a piece. So I bought like seventy movies. It was great. Oh, you get any <laughs> Disney classics in there? Uh, I got like the live action Maleficent. Uh, there weren't, you know, obviously the the good ones were pretty quick to go. And well, I have a I have most. I don't have the Black Cauldron, but I had most of them already. So I didn't need those. But uh, yeah, I, I was there like intentionally buying bad movies because I have that podcast where I do bad movies now. So I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna buy Spy Kids four. <laughs> I have to talk <laughs> about it in a few months. Might as well watch it on Blu-ray. <laughs> Might as well own a piece of history. Mordecai, I got Mordecai. I want to see Johnny Depp's worst performance. <laughs> so, and, and there was some good stuff in there too. I actually did get, um, which I'll finally quit calling paging Mr. Banks because I finally watched Saving Mr. Banks. That, that was in there. So I, I did watch that. Um, <laughs> which honestly, uh, it, it's, it's fine. It's, a, I mean, it's an okay movie, but I was like, okay, I didn't need to watch that before we did Mary Poppins. That's fine. <laughs> Is there a Japanese equivalent of Disney? Like, I, I don't know if it would be like an anime studio Ghibli. or like, Ghibli. is that is that pretty much the closest oh, we, there is to it? Yeah, we even have Ghibli Land now. They just, I just, I, a student, I uh, went, I asked a student, what'd you do this weekend? It's like, I went to Ghibli Land in Nagoya. So I don't think Ghibli Land has so many rides. It has more like experiences and recreations of stuff from like Totoro or uh, Chendo, uh, Chendo mm. Chihiro, which is um, Spirited Away. Yeah. So it has that sort of stuff. You can get in a cat bus. <laughs> so a spirited away ride would be weird yeah i don't i don't really know how they address spirited away in that so um haven't been there but i i'd like to go uh i don't uh other for, for the real little tykes there's ampamon which um you have not heard of right no i've never heard of ampamon okay everyone in japan knows ampamon um He's a bread. Ampan is like a, a bread with red bean in it. So he lives in Happy Town and he's been baked by his baker. Uh, and he fights like Baikyuan, who's like a virus. But there's like, it's in like the Guinness Book of Records as the franchise with the most characters. Uh, they have like 2,000 or something characters. And uh, Pokemon, one of the reasons Pokemon keeps just evolving their Pokemon or, or, you know not adding new ones is because they don't want to overtake Ampamon because that's like seems like horrible that's like kicking big bird to the ground or something <laughs> so they're, but, uh, they're holding themselves back to not to not take them out of the history books that's my theory at least i mean i don't know that for a <laughs> fact and but no it super permeates japan uh two two days ago i was teaching a kid who's like four years old the lesson's basically fine i have to do what he wants to do i can't really teach my lesson because he has no attention span um and before class, he insisted I drag in this Ampamon puppet, right? And when the class ended, he just went insane, started throwing a tantrum, and we had to let him go with the Ampamon puppet. So, <laughs> like, like, it got to a point where I was like, okay, just take the puppet. Maybe please bring it back because we use that for our trial lessons. <laughs> yeah, it was one of the most insane tantrums I'd ever seen. Uh, the, the other guy there was like, well, what went wrong? I was like, the lesson was fine. It was it was after the lesson that was the problem. <laughs> So uh yeah. So kids kids love their Ampamon. You can visit yeah, the, 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 Ampamon the programming Museum. is strong. Yeah, yeah, really. I'll I'll make sure and get you an image uh of Ampamon. Uh you would not show the same kids the Black Codger, of course. It is more hardcore. It's it's Disney's first PG. So which... so that comes up a, a lot. Uh not not that it was the first PG, but that it was more for like adults or you know, slightly older kids. And I guess if you were to compare that to like a fairy tale movie. Yeah, but would this, I don't know, does this really feel like it would be scary enough that it would scare a child just because what they've got, like skeleton warriors at certain points? Well, um, the original cut of the movie was apparently 18 minutes longer. Uh, when they did test screenings, the the cauldron born sequence was legitimately terrifying because they'd show like these skeleton army or skeleton soldiers like getting mangled and you know, like reconstituted and kids were like literally screaming in the theater so uh katzenberg had just started working for disney around this time and 
I mean, he he took the thing to the editing bay and really went nuts. Where to the point where uh, the others were like, I, I guess Eisner and so so forth were like, dude, don't cut it down that much. And there was a compromise basically. So there, were, especially from that climactic sequence, there's a fair amount cut. You can hear the soundtrack jump at one point where they just couldn't do a clean uh, edit. It's a little bit incoherent because you're missing pieces. Um, but it was, I mean, I think what they had in the original cut might have, uh, they thought might have actually gotten them an R rating. So, <laughs> which I want to see that cut for sure, you know? Of yeah, you're, you're selling that, that one. At the same time, I just have to, I have to think out loud that 18 minutes never would have filled all the, the gaps in this movie for me. Uh, it might have been a way cooler visuals and certain scenes might have been more impressive but I don't feel like 20 minutes would have saved this thing from itself. You no, know, the extra stuff would be more there to terrify you than uh, to really add the story. But hey, a little more terror would also be fine. You know, that, that might make up for a bit of story chop, you know, if if it's just more disturbing. Like, uh, oh, take a movie like Prometheus, right? Where it has so many cool elements and the thing doesn't hold together in the end. <laughs> Which also uh, shows at the beginning a reconstitution of skeletons and turning into other forms. Exactly. So, yeah, honestly, yeah. there's a, there's a lot of cool Prometheus links to this movie if you wanted to go down that route. Yeah, the Horn God could be an engineer for all we know. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. Uh, of course, Prometheus being the 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 new go to for it's a Christmas movie because no one so that would make it. uh Gogi would have been um or Gurgi would have been Daniel right the AI guy. Oh yeah, I suppose so. I I was thinking of the um the alien that that one scientist becomes infatuated with, even though he's terrified of them like 10 seconds before. <laughs> he's like, what's this? Come here, little buddy. Yeah. It's like, dude, what are you doing? You know, the, the, Oh, what a cute little face hugger. I definitely haven't seen, you know, this is in the, the near future in Prometheus. We won't go on too much of a tangent, but that guy must have known about the half-life uh, sort of, you know, universe. And you see those little face hugger things. That's not a cute thing. That thing's going to kill you. And you'd think the captain would understand you can run left or right, not straight when a ship is falling on you. But, yeah, that's, that's fine. <laughs> I don't know. It's a, you know, Who knows what you do in that situation? That was a symbolism, man. It was a symbolism. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was a big ship, too. So even running left might have not really helped that much. We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, this one, though, yeah. How do you want to tackle it? I mean, it is kind well, of hard. so. So I wanted to I wanted to mention first that this movie had every element that would have made it the perfect movie, even now watching it. But for some reason, with all the cool elements combined, it just it came out kind of mediocre. Like there wasn't there wasn't anything in this movie that really compelled me to to like want to rewatch it or stop scenes and rewatch them again or uh, even like do like a bigger deeper dive it, it it almost felt like a little bit of a slog to get through despite every unique element being cool the animation looking great but all that together it was like the weirdest combination it was i don't know it's like if you, if you have a kid make you breakfast you know what i mean they put like all the ingredients in that you like independently but when it's all combined it's just kind of a big mess and i guess that it shows i don't know how many projects can go through a creative uh, gestation period as you called it of over you know 12 to 15 years and still come out with like a coherent vision because that's 12 years of nitpicking and you know not just the the final edit where they you know take out 18 minutes but just that process of editing over and over that must have happened over 12 years and people that you know picked it up and put it back down you kind of feel it in the I don't know the, the anti-continuity the lack of continuity in the story itself but also ironically this was disney trying to take five books um and put it into you know an hour and a half long movie and even those five books originally were a little bit too short the original publisher of the the pride and chronicles wanted the guy to, to go back um you know lloyd to rewrite and add another book to the series which he did because originally it was going to be four books and then it turned into five so this story itself has this backstory of always almost like getting rushed out before everything is ready. So the original series almost happened like that when it went from four books to five. Disney tries putting it together. And now here, we're going to try and take all of that and put, you know, what Disney did in the original articles and some of the symbolism into like 60 minutes. Yeah, um, you're talking about too many, too many cooks there. 
And one of the, I know the horn god at one point was going to be a very large red bearded Viking. Uh, so I think that change is probably good. I mean, if instead of our skeleton god, you'd you'd have a wait. Viking yeah, the beard. Skeletor uh, version is way cooler than than I think that one would have been a little bit more of a direct reference to the source material not not the Pradane chronicles but what Pradane was based on like the actual wealth mythology it sounds like they might have tried to go that angle originally but i definitely like the the dragon's lair zelda you know aesthetic that we got instead of just straight up wealth mythology right right um here here's a, here's lloyd alexander the author's quote about the movie which I, it does seem to pretty much take i haven't read the books so i mean maybe i'll read the books and hate them but uh he said first i have to say there's no resemblance between the movie and the book having said that the movie in itself purely as a movie i found to be very enjoyable i had fun watching it what i would hope is that anyone who sees the movie would certainly enjoy it but i'd also hope that they'd actually read the book the book's quite different it's a very powerful moving story I think people would find a lot more depth in the book. So he was like, for the love of God, please read my book. Yeah, please don't don't judge me on this. <laughs> Which, I mean, yeah, it. I guess just watching it with the eyes of, I want to see some mind-blowing animation. I did actually quite enjoy watching this, uh, you know. Uh, well, this yeah, week, so. eye candy-wise, it's amazing. It's it's cool to just see all of the different clips together. But at the end of it, it I don't know, it, it lacked... Uh, it lacked that je ne sais quoi where you're like, I just watched a great movie. Like there's that feeling that you went on like an adventure and you saw character development. Maybe that was part of it is that, I mean, they, they go through the paces, but I don't see any like major character development throughout it. Like it's the same people that exist the whole time. Yeah. Turan is pretty much the same at the beginning as he is at the end. It's not like he's doing something stupid, makes a mistake. And he's he got the guffin re- sword. <laughs> right? Yeah, he doesn't, he never really makes a mistake. So, you know, like he doesn't, like they send him on a hero's journey, but nothing really happens as far as the hero's journey is concerned, you know? <laughs> yeah, there's that, there's not like the original denial and then having to come to terms and then, um, you know, crossing the, I guess there's like a crossing of the threshold in a way. Uh, but there's no real like atonement. I don't know. It's it, it it misses some of the important elements that would have made it a great story slash movie. But it, but just like uh, Lloyd Alexander mentioned, and he, and Black Culture, I believe, was the second book in the series out of the five books. So you wouldn't even have like watched the movie and then jumped right into the Black Culture, and you would have started with the book of three, which was the you know uh, confusingly the first book of the series, and then the Black Culture and um so yeah like again to take these five different stories that went on these like large complex tales that had lots of lots of characters like game of thrones style characters maybe not as much as pokemon or what what the thing you were mentioning before um but to take that and turn it into an 80 minute movie it just it never was going to happen so even though they tried to just isolate the black cauldron story they didn't even necessarily stay with within the the scope of just that one book and what they did end up with was kind of just like a hodgepodge of like different aspects of the whole series. Um, I, I'm noting right near the top of my notes, so probably in the first five minutes of the movie, I did write, I suppose this is a hero's journey. Otherwise, this film goes nowhere. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I think I, I accidentally maybe reviewed it a bit at the, in the, at the start of my notes there. Because I, in the end, yeah, it's, it's what sound and fury signifying nothing, right? <laughs> um. So, how, who, I, I guess you can tell us a little bit more. Who is Lloyd Alexander? How, how does he shake out in this whole thing? Now that I've extensively quoted him, <laughs> he seems like a fine young man. Uh, uh, so there was a couple interesting things that I, I, I've been piecing these together uh, through the other movies that we've been watching, and just a lot of like a, original children's stories in general. And there's a couple ongoing themes. One is that a lot of them end up coming from like affluent families already, which makes enough sense that, you know, some rich guy that, you know, their kid writes a book, you, you give it some extra reviews and publicity at a time before internet, you know? So if you knew someone that ran the paper or the radio station or whatever, you got way more publicity than someone that didn't. In this case, it's a little different though. Uh, This didn't come out of rich. This came out of, the U S intelligence agency and not necessarily like the CIA put this movie out or anything, but there's another ongoing theme that a lot of 
Disney stories, even animators and just like production in general, a lot of them have ties to early World War II and after um, era intelligence. And this is no different. I don't think that it's not like the intelligence agencies are planting people into Disney, but it's something about working in intelligence specifically, I think gives them more access. Maybe they get to travel around a little bit more and spend a lot of time like reading and researching cultures because a lot of these intelligence guys that for military reasons go out to learn a culture of a certain people that they're, you know, they're living with or they're uh, investigating and they, they end up falling in love with the mythology and the legends and bringing that back and writing it up in the stories. So this one, he, um, Lloyd Alexander, I'm trying to find my notes. So he, he's got some overlap. He was at a uh, camp Ritchie and in world war two, he was essentially a intelligence officer but what was interesting is that there is another group called the Ritchie Boys. And this is it, it's not necessarily paperclip area. Paperclip were, you know, actual Nazis that the US brought over. But outside of just paperclip, which gets a lot of exposure because of the, you know, the the German Nazis in there, but they also had the Ritchie Boys. And the Ritchie Boys were just people caught up in the middle of it, just regular Germans. Um, that wanted to, you know, escape Germany and not have to deal with World War II. And they would come over into the States and work as intelligence. There was 20,000 of them. And there's direct overlap with when Lloyd Alexander was in the intelligence for the army and when all of these Ritchie boys and he was at that base. So it's it seems beyond likely that he was kind of embedded within Richie boys in general. And I think they were credited with the, like over 60% of the intelligence uh, that had to do with Europe during world war two. So the, the guy has a, a interesting background with military intelligence being the, the leading point here. And I feel like this is an, like a, an ever persisting sort of coincidence. We'll call it a coincidence for now uh, after it happens three or four more times and I'll start calling it a conspiracy. <laughs> well yeah i guess the most fun one I, that kind of makes sense because watching this movie um we're talking about welsh tales being the source but um there does the, the does have the feeling of the darkness of a bavarian woods you know so add a little german into it makes sense um i i, I guess my favorite obvious intelligence connection is uh Stuart and miles copeland you, you know that one do you you have to explain it more uh, Stuart Copeland was the drummer for The Police. Uh, his his brother is Miles Copeland, who and their father was CIA. They were actually born in Lebanon, or what? Or Stuart was born in Lebanon, I think, because his dad was an agent. Uh, Miles Copeland got into whole lots of stuff. I believe he started the record label IRS. So they just keep throwing out all these alphabet things at you. You know, the the successful bands, The Police. It's like, hey, everyone, we're involved with intelligence. Look at us, look at us. And they're waving their arms around. That's, that's pretty fun stuff. So, I mean, if, if you look into the 60s and 70s, almost every avenue of pop culture feels like, I don't think it came from intelligence agencies, but what intelligence agencies had was the connections to all these different groups. And they would just put people that were either favorable to them or people that were willing to share the secrets or give them notes or let them come in and take notes. They kind of got more push than others. Like if you, if you look at like a hate Ashbury, for example, uh, a lot of like those original musician, I think Frank Zappa's dad um, was oh, yeah, Laurel, Laurel Canyon, like Laurel every, Canyon, every, every band one. has like one person whose right. father was an <laughs> officer, you know, like, um, you know, the birds, I, I think David Crosby's, uh, was in, I mean he's involved in, or was involved in tons of weird stuff you know um Buffalo Springfield maybe Stephen Stills father of course Jim Morrison notor his dad notoriously started yeah, go, the go Vietnam War good. yeah <laughs> so you know all these bands have someone you know so so, so I so that so that analogy with how it happened in you know music in the 60s 70s probably even still today right but I feel that there's a a similar correlation within the animation world. And it would have the exact same justifications and reasons as why they would want to plant people in the music world to have a little bit of control over culture and a little bit of say. So why not do that with, you know, animated movies as well? And not to mention that so many and this this blows my mind, but they would people would literally be working at Disney, go off and fight in World War Two and then come back and then like continue the movie that they left off before the war started. 
uh, which is just a, a surreal concept of like this guy's drawing cartoons. He goes and, you know, kills a few people and then comes back and continues drawing the cartoon. Um, and some of that was like just baked into classic Disney animation. I don't know if that still exists today. Like if someone would be, you know, working on a Disney movie and then get called in the service and go and blow up, uh, you know, a couple schools in the Middle East and then go back to work, you know, a few years later, uh, just that's such a foreign concept of what happens in modern day. But that was, again, like original DNA in a lot of these Disney movies. And like, I guess I'm not saying that Lloyd Alexander killed anybody. He was just an <laughs> intelligence agent. Uh, but it's it's just this this interesting ongoing thread of U.S. intelligence and Disney movies. Yeah, I, I, I just went on a, a for not for the first time, a Buster Keaton obsession Um and I was reading his autobiography where he's saying like, I, yeah, I made a few really successful shorts, got drafted, spent seven months in France where he almost lost his hearing, you know, didn't sleep in a bed for six months, came back and, you know, kept making comedies through the 20s that, that were genius. So it is interesting how you can have that like really I, and he wasn't on the front lines, but it was, you know, in France and World War One, it wasn't like a real nice place. Right. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's a weird it's a weird concept because now. Um, so used to people just jumping jobs for no reason, but man, like some huge traumatic event, it's, it's like, it changes your entire life now it seems, but you go back to this golden age of animation in particular. And it was like the animators for whatever reason that were working on these movies, you know, they didn't come back and turn into like counter revolutionaries or anything. They just went right back into work with, for, uh, for old uncle Walt. I guess you just take that experience and you just try and put it in a drawer and move on with your life. You don't want to be defined by it. That sort of thing. <laughs> that I, I, yeah, I agree with that, but I also feel that maybe Walt was like the ultimate drill sergeant. So they go to like actual war and they're like, Oh, this, you know, I've been here before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The Disney studio is being a much more hardcore place than the shores of Normandy. Maybe. <laughs> Yeah, can, can we stay here? And <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm gonna hope that's not the case. Um, interestingly, this was the last movie they made at the Burbank studio. They moved to Glendale for ten years, and then I think they came back in the mid '90s. But uh, they they and this, this was supposed to be their big revival movie. This was supposed to take them out of the slump. But I, I guess every movie they came out with was supposed to take them out of the slump, right? <laughs> Until they actually got out of the slump. Yeah, this this one ultimately got the title the film that almost killed Disney as the budget turned out to be uh, in the end, 44 million. It made like 22 or 23 million domestically. So those are, you know, very bad numbers. <laughs> yeah. Commercial and critical failure on every metric uh, when um, it came out, you know, the Disney Renaissance is four years in the future. So the, the next few films we're going to look at uh, was that um, great mouse detective Oliver and company. Uh, and, not bad, but definitely like turning the dial down for a little while, right? Because the animation department was almost just ended right then and there. And I mean, really, when you think about it, except for those prime renaissance years, I mean, the, the Disney's animation department is always under the chopping block, even even now, right? I mean, especially now. Yeah, it'll be AI soon, so. Yeah, especially now that they're focusing on just making all these quote-unquote live action, you know, um, golems or whatever <laughs> but yeah uh, i am pretty much out what is it um yeah the, the little mermaid just came out which i i don't even have an opinion i'm like i've already like just decided to not pay attention to these weird live action things you know <laughs> well I, there was an article that was fairly recent about a possible live action black cauldron or at least chronicles of pridane um that might be coming out so and i think by disney I mean, well, actually, this is okay. If they just drop the Black Cauldron name until a second, they want to do a try and do a film series. I mean, that seems reasonable. It, it wouldn't. It it could actually work because this is one case where the original movie itself is kind of like begging to be remade uh, at some level. But also, the the one thing working against it, I think, is it's almost just like a kids' version of Witcher, right? Like. Great. If you like the Witcher series, then you might like this, but this is just like a kid version, Um, which ironically Lloyd Alexander, I saw an interview where he mentioned that he he was able to address much more serious topics in the context of a children's series than he could if it were written for adults, because if it was written for adults, they're expecting all these like extra 
bells and whistles and like complexities and and um you know not being able to address things direct on but having it more like you know vaguely implied you know fa- fanciful sort of uh english literature rules but for writing for children not only was he able to uh, tackle some of those concepts head on but he was able to do it in like a a much more serious way than he would have been able to for any other sort of demographic so i, I thought that was just an interesting i never heard that before and it makes a lot of sense that you almost have to not just simplify it, but explain it in terms that aren't so flowery. And uh, and I think that, that that was an advantage to the book series, but it was weird because they tried to like maybe scale it up a little bit, like make it more adult than the series was for the animation. So if they did it live action, they might actually, here and now, you know, 2023, they might actually be able to make like a serious adult PG-13 version that could still be based on the source material with kids in it. Yeah, yeah, it's like like how you do with sci-fi too. You just, you um slip in the message. You know, you got Star Trek commenting on the Vietnam War while the Vietnam War is going on, which you could not do if you set your episode in the Vietnam War, right? So um that would have been an interesting hollow deck uh one. <laughs> <laughs> That's TOS they didn't have the hollow deck yet, but yeah. <laughs> but yeah, 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 that'd be fun. Yeah. I I doubt people put Vietnam in the hollow deck that often. Uh, and, and, well, they're like, yeah, you know, bring up computer bring up a vietnam simulation play fortunate son right (laughs) that's the only way you can do it right turns Um, into a far cry game so i i don't know that we're talking we've been talking about the whale the welsh stuff which i don't know too much about my my welsh knowledge is basically uh the super furry animals and uh well i just finished doing the the prisoners uh the prisoner series which of course uh filmed a a lot in port melian right but that's that's just a weird place in Wales. <laughs> so, well, so so the book series uh, came to be known as the Prydain Chronicles, and Prydain, I believe, comes from Pridery. And I'm going to get all of these these names horribly butchered. That's but why I haven't been saying it myself. <laughs> Pry- Pridery Fab Pwil, I think, is the, is the a, a prominent sure. god in or you know figure in Welsh mythology, um, and this it, it's long and detailed like if you thought disney trying to cram five books in the 80 minutes would have been hard imagine trying to explain wealth welsh mythology um as a whole into a a shorter amount of time but but this pridery is where i think the pride um the the pride world comes from but even more interesting that is that henwen the pig also is like is directly from the same um welsh mythology so henwen the pig uh, was this this white female pig and i love the animation depiction of like the oracular pig where she like puts her head into the the bucket of water and just immediately zones out and turns into like a fortune teller like hit into like hypnosis i always wondered in the movie itself if the pig if henwin even knows that she's an oracular pig or if it happens like outside of her own consciousness because it's so instant but henwin the pig was this like white pig that gives birth to a black cat and as I mentioned earlier, that the black cat ends up turning into this monster that kills King Arthur in some versions of the the legends. So there's definitely some uh some like inverse logic, magic aspects of that, you know, uh a white female pig that's, you know, the good guy that then gives birth to like the black antichrist cat that kills, you know, God, King Arthur. So I I, I really feel like that is such a deep uh, storyline. We could turn an like, entire episode just into the symbolism on that mechanic. And that's just Henwen the pig, which is the coolest character in the whole movie, in my opinion. Yeah, probably. I can Googie. Go- 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 yeah, I could. He would so Ger- got Gergi, I've got a, a, a different interpretation on that I wanted to bring up a, a theory. Maybe we'll, we'll propose a new theory here. Well, but that Gergi is a different archetype that's not necessarily defined in the the same like you know young and and all of their different like types of archetypes but gurgi is the opposite of like the wise old man or the regular sidekick or just like a trickster he's like the annoying um the annoying sidekick that that specifically seems to come from movies uh i don't think this archetype exists outside of movies but you could say Jar Jar Binks is kind of along the same lines of this like Gurgi sort of character. 
by and everybody. I feel like that labyrinth. They had the the dog that definitely filled in uh, Sir whatever his name is, which definitely right. Filled That's in another that great example. No, I think it was a fox actually, wasn't it? I, it's been a little while since, well, not that long since I watched it, but uh, uh, although yeah. the the fox the fox and labyrinth, I, I give more credit to to him because he was actually like a um he did things right he, he actually helped them out and did things that they couldn't i think when they crossed the bog was like his uh when he they show some of his weakness but he was actually trying to move the plot forward jar jar banks maybe not as much gurky <laughs> maybe not as much uh and originally gurky was just some annoying little dog-like animal that you know the characters could have easily just ignored him and just kept on their way and then he turns into like the thing that they have to go and save and uh, almost a MacGuffin, almost like a, an animated MacGuffin on its own. But I, but I feel that there's this interesting movie only archetype that's been developed over a course of different movies and and platforms. But it's essentially that that Jar Jar Gurgi style archetype, and it's it's fascinating to me because they serve a purpose. Like they they annoy people, and and you have to know that it annoys people. Although I guess some people think it's cute and it's kind of like you know uh, lovable in some ways. But I feel that that dichotomy is just like injecting a little bit of controversy in these in these movies. Oh, I don't know more. if it's like a if it was like a misstep or if they're intentionally doing it. I, I'd say the the long term. Uh not exploitation long-term expression of that archetype might be a star trek voyagers neelix <laughs> where you get seven years of it <laughs> <laughs> but uh that that's a that's a case where it's like oh the actor's really good but this character sucks so hard <laughs> so yeah yeah just since i've been watching some of that <laughs> like, I, like the actor. I need I to come up you. we need to come up with a good name for whatever that archetype is because it can't be you know like you've got trickster you've got the wise old man you've got all of these well-established archetypes, but I do feel that I'm going to keep referring to it as Gurgi and Jar Jar, but like that archetype also exists and it's been repeated enough that it deserves to have a name out there. The Derpler. The, der <laughs> the Derpler. <laughs> He's very derpy. Uh, <laughs> there's probably a better name than that. But, you know, I, it was five seconds thought that's what I got for you. <laughs> it, it's beyond just derpy though. It's It's almost like an annoying pesty derpiness like mm. aggressively derpy you know what i mean yeah 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 so it's like it's kind of like um one of the most annoying things i think is someone with an annoying voice talking to you condescendingly so maybe <laughs> <that's>, <laughs> like they're trying to sound kind of saying but you can tell that there's like low intelligence coming coming from this corner so <laughs> maybe maybe, I, maybe that's defining the archetype a little more so I don't know. Yeah, no, I don't think Gurgi can condescend to you. Yeah, maybe good point. Jar could con Jar Jar Bings condescend to you. You think? Well, he'd he'd try and get deep on you, right? With the the whole <laughs> piece of people gonna die or whatever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that, that is, good. That's an archetype we can flush uh, for the most part. I can't think of a example that really worked. C three PO is kind of there. I guess that kind of functions as as a. Because C3PO annoys you, but you're you're always wanting to let him be there. So, yeah, no, I I again, I I feel like we're we're honing into something interesting though, like this this new archetype that hasn't been defined yet. Yeah, yeah. And and I wanted to mention one other interesting. I don't I don't think I've had a chance to bring this particular topic up because it hasn't presented itself. But I really wanted to know if you've heard of this before. But there's a a concept in this this uh black cauldron in the movie as they're opening it up they mentioned that that uh some people were thrown alive or that a person was thrown alive into this crucible of molten iron and then it basically turns that evil essence and it encapsulates it but there's a very real concept of that and i think it was pretty big in japan called the human pillar and it's essentially when they would bury someone alive um under a building that they were they were putting together or if they're making a bridge um, they would usually bury someone alive along with the foundations of that bridge. The idea is that their spirit would stay with that foundation and scare away other bad spirits and kind of act as like a protector ghost. Um, so have you, have you ever heard of that before? The, it, I think it's called the human pillar. Yeah, I've not heard of anything that dark. Um, of course, there is the concept in you know, the whole Shinto side of Japan where like getting back to Totoro, Totoro is the mountain god. He is the god of that mountain. So, you know, every 
place or thing has something associated with it. Um, a business opens, you know, there's always a bunch of flowers and plaques out also when someone dies. So uh, there is like the God of this place, the spirit protects this place vibe. Um, although, yeah, the one you're. So yeah, maybe... definitely Shinto. And it was called a uh, Hito Bashira. That's essentially the, the, you know, the translated version of human pillar. And it, and a lot of the time it was unwitting people or unwilling people that would be cast into this, but there's also a lot of versions where it's not just being buried alive. But um, I think there was a there was a certain bell, the story about this bell. I think it was a Tibetan bell, and that when they cast it the first few times, when they would go to strike it, it made no sound. It was a completely inaudible bell, and they they kept trying to remake it over and over. And then eventually, they take the one of the original engineers, I guess and then put him into the molten mixture. And then when they remake the bell with this person that had been like boiled into it, then it finally made this like incredibly loud ringing bell. And of course it's, you know, this is mythology baked into it, but I feel like it, there's this interesting archetype too of a human person being merged into some sort of like blacksmith or, you know, masonry and that the merging of like that person and this other material turns it into magic. Like it just makes it a magic cauldron. That's that does sound a little bit like the climactic stuff they cut out of this movie. That might have been the really disturbing stuff that uh Katzenberg was was going into the editing bay about. Um let's see if I can get a good description of, of what they cut exactly. Um because it, it sounds like it just would have been a much more visual depiction of you know, combining this this living, breathing person or evil spirit into the cauldron itself. Yeah, what an awesome sequence that that would have been. And and I saw another quote too that someone that was in the production of this movie uh, mentioned. I'm gonna um, roughly paraphrase it, but it was like some of the best material that I've ever worked on that never got seen or that, that got wasted mm -hmm. uh, and that no one ever got a chance to experience. We had scenes of the cauldron born mauling the henchmen, as well as one of them being dissolved by the mist. Um, maybe okay, maybe not quite the merging you're talking about, but that certainly, yeah, yeah, that ta that makes sense with with this particular cauldron. Uh, I, we got time to hit another character or two if you if you want to. We we've done the we've done the pig, we've done the the dog. We've, so thing. we've yeah we've got also um Kerr Dalbin who's the mentor. We've also got, uh, I mean, I guess, Terran himself, but also to, they refer to him as Ter of Ter Dalbin, but Dalbin was also, I believe, like the area that they lived in. It, it gets a little bit uh, confusing when you try to, to figure out what's actually going on with the the whole entire area. But, but I also want to mention on the Henwen, the pig, that oracular pig, there was uh, a lot of other sort of mystical uh, sort of like characteristics that were giving to pigs around this time. They had something called the great hunt. And this is when in Britain, they would all go out and hunt uh, wild boar. And it was a particularly dangerous thing to do because even with the most modern weaponry they had at the time and, you know, the armor, whatever they would put on the, the tusks of these wild boar would just decimate people. You know, that you would, very likely end up not coming back with the same amount of people that you went out with just to do this, uh, this boar hunt thing. So the boars and by proxy, the pigs end up becoming elevated in a lot of these old sort of like Welsh tales. So it's, it's interesting to see how highly the, the pig kind of gets out. Like in America, you know, there's nothing magical about pigs. Essentially you've got babe and you've got Charlotte's web. And that's kind of the extent is that maybe a pig can like talk or be cute. But well, in, uh, in Welsh piggy. mythology, they're they're badasses, dude. Pigs are badasses. <laughs> yeah, well, facing a, a tusked boar is definitely different than facing Miss Piggy. So, I know the Miss when Piggy now will beat nowadays you, up for you sure. just hunt them out of a helicopter at night, anyways, with with like night vision. So, <laughs> right, right, they never have a chance. <laughs> um, maybe we should put the horned god on tracking our our Disney villains because it seems like Chernabog to Maleficent to this one is definitely a line like I said they seem to need to occasionally invoke this you know ultimate dark force thing right 
Well, and and more directly, I know this is based based on Welsh mythology, um, but the Horn God goes back so far. I mean, the the first thing that comes up in mind is Ball or Ball uh, Hammond, who essentially is like the main archetype of every monotheistic god that ever you know came and a lot of pagan gods that came out afterwards he turns into zeus essentially um and then zeus turns into every other god that we've we've kind of amalgamated since then but that horned god is essentially agricultural gods sympathetic magic gods the the horns typically come from a bull and it's a reference to sacred cow worship which is the oldest pagan religion that i think that we've we've kind of uncovered is uh, it tends to go with uh, the sun worship. You've got um, the Egyptians, which would hold the sun between, you know, the horns. You've got um, the nature magic of Balhamen, um, that was uh, again the, the horn god. You've got Pan, uh, who's the horn god. Dionysus, Bacchus, a lot of them were always depicted with horns because of the, the same reasons. Um, so I, I feel that this horned god is the same as Chernobog. It's the same that's tapping into basically nature magic. It's weird how this stuff kind of just like subconsciously like comes out through things. I, I'm just sitting here looking at music I made 12 years ago, uh, instrumental music, which features a track called Musings of the Horned God, which my collaborator named. So on a soundtrack for something called Nude Witchcraft. So... <laughs> <laughs> Man, you could read so Do much. Do you think into he might that. have just watched the Black Cauldron before that? <laughs> May, well, maybe the guy that named the track did. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> um, well, he's currently that, that's my buddy who is currently um trying to teach himself uh Scottish Gaelic. So you know, <laughs> you get down these little little rabbit holes here and there. <laughs> it just sounds like someone's choking, doing trills. I have a note here too that the the horned god's sidekick was a hundred times cooler um, than Gurgi was. Like he had the cool sidekick. Oh yeah, that's. Uh, I think I put a note that that's who, what I want to see the plush of because you know the the stuffed animal for. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the fun one. Um, the princess that barely needs to be in this movie. That that's a question. I guess she has more to do in the books. I'm gonna guess because she certainly just is here to be a to look like aurora and have a name that you can't pronounce so i'm not saying her name yeah and i i think too there was probably a push like every disney movie needed to have a princess it's at some level i guess another interesting thing is that this uh this is definitely not musical there's no songs in this movie but ironically i feel like it might have benefited from one or two i actually yeah. think that a black cauldron song could have worked better than black cauldron with no songs in 1985 it would have been a pop song though you know see again yeah Lazarus. but maybe then you get bowie maybe that's oh, yeah. when you get bowie in man that's so it's you... it's hard to i mean it's it's hard to know what could have been because all we have is what was although i am thinking we have not had a proper princess in a disney movie since sleeping beauty so maybe they we were like well, oh, what God, do you find as proper princess, princess? I mean, just someone who's actually called a princess, right? Because uh, well, what you the got red... the frog princess. Oh no, I'm talking about uh, from 1959 or whatever to 1985, and that mm. time period we don't have so many princesses. So, uh, oh, oh, uh, yeah, Robin Hood. Okay, there we got one there. So, <laughs> well, she's a maid. She's well, maid, Marian. yeah, maid Marian's not necessarily a princess. Yeah, so maybe they were really like, oh my god, we haven't had one in a while. Please, please add one because we're about to, you know, the late 80s and. 90s is just prime princess territory right <laughs> you know i'm curious it, it probably isn't the the best watch if you just saw someone play dragon's lair end to end but i'm sure there's like a playthrough on youtube but if you were to watch just a full playthrough of dragon's lair and then watch black cauldron i wonder which one would be the one you'd want to to like do a second viewing of Oh, I bet Dragon Slayer is a whole lot shorter. That that helps. <laughs> brevity, <laughs> brevity can also uh, can often be a a good motivator for that sort of thing. <laughs> but I'm I'm gonna sit here and check what the length of Dragon Slayer actually is because I'm I'm curious. Um, I remember a lot of screaming. That's all because you keep dying, right? Well, I guess if you yeah, if you have all the deaths in as well, uh, you might get some. Oh yeah, you'd have to cut out the death scenes, but that's a a huge chunk of it for sure. A full playthrough is only 12 minutes. Oh, wow. There, 
there is a cartoon series of Dragon Slayer. If you want to watch that, you're going to spend four and a half hours. Oh, here's another one that runs for 27 minutes. Maybe that shows you like all of the, the various ways you can die or something. So Yeah, that's just going to be lots of screaming for sure. Yeah, so th- there's some ranging anywhere from 11 to 25, but you know, certainly shorter than than the Black Cauldron. Um, you were mentioning the music. I, I should also throw in that Elmer Bernstein did the soundtrack, and they cut most of his soundtrack too. So, well, that sucks uh, for him. Yeah, and uh, for us, it's one of those things where later they, you know, like they put it out on vinyl. It's sort of like the Alex North 2001 A Space Odyssey soundtrack that is not in the movie was eventually released. Dra- uh, Dragon's Lair. The Black Cauldron itself is weird. Um, I noticed it was not released on video, VHS, until 1997 and 98, depending on the country. In pan and scan, which is insane because it's late 90s and this is a very widescreen movie. Um, and it did not come out on Blu-ray until two years ago. So that kind of blew my mind. <laughs> DVD. So was there a- hasn't been a, a non-pan and scanned commercial release of this until two years ago? Oh, uh, I think there was a DVD around 2008 or something. Uh, but that would have 20... been a pan and scan, right? I, th- I think just that original DVD was pan and scan. But yeah, if you've been, okay. if you had been waiting, I don't know. In 1997, do you care if it's pan? And... I cared if it's pan and scan or letterbox. I remember buying VHS and those big clamshell, uh, gold ones that were like you know Fox widescreen. So and the, the soaking those in. Um, let me check on that DVD release. The box office was up here. Another two. That home media. There we go. Uh, yeah, the DVD did not come out until 2010, but that did include the the correct transfer. So yeah, so 2010 is when you got it in the correct aspect ratio. But that's a long time. I mean, that's one of the reasons I guess no one had a chance to reassess this movie at all because no one could really watch it properly. <laughs> Which I guess we're reassessing and saying the story doesn't really work, but that man, the animation is properly mind blowing. I mean, this deserves one view just to watch the animation. You can like, you know, play some uh, some Bowie over it while you're watching it if you want. You know, <laughs> look at the animation. Actually, that might not be a bad idea. There, there's probably a <laughs> there's probably a better way to watch this Pink Floyd style where you just synchronize the music of some album and put this on mute and it would probably elevate it to uh, quite a bit may as well go with the labyrinth soundtrack <laughs> <laughs> but by the way that it's definitely not the best bowie it's just the best bowie from the mid 80s <laughs> when he notoriously did not want to make music because <laughs> uh yeah never let me down and what's the other one there's in there or the babe yeah, you see that that's great, right? That's the best. But yeah, if you compare that with the late '70s stuff, and it's yeah, it's like yeah, mostly production. I think it's because it's got the you know digital '80s production where I, I like the weird analog clunk of the late '70s. So, well, and also in the late '70s, mid '80s, it was far more appropriate David Bowie style to have like an adult, very sexual man uh, lusting or at least pursuing like an underage, you know, kid. <laughs> that was like pretty much typical that that was a weird thing uh at the end of last year when california lifted its statute of limitations and steven tyler was was sued by um by by one of his groupies from the 70s and it's like wait a minute wait, wait you're telling me a 70s rock star did it with <laughs> a minor no way and and the, it was weird because uh i he actually kind of shot himself in the foot because he tried to make it legal back in the day by making her his guardian so she could actually legally be with him. <laughs> so there was like a paper trail. That was his mistake, making a paper trail. <laughs> uh, dude, people did it so out in the open in the, in the 70s that it was, I guess, they weren't really afraid of it as much. What was uh, Mackenzie Phillips, um, which, which uh, her dad was John Phillips of Mamas and Papas, I think to end up having like a relationship with his own kid and it was it was a wild time it was a wild freaking yeah time. yeah steven tyler's a stand-up guy and uh, compared to that so <laughs> actually i did meet steven tyler once and he seemed like out of his mind but he was like nice uh, i worked at a um in maine i worked at an outdoor camp and, and his kid like was going to a school nearby so they came and he actually came as a chaperone um and he had the kids out at midnight singing in the front of the dorm. So I'm, I wasn't the manager of the camp, so I didn't have to deal with that. But yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I, I thought that was cool. He was hanging out at our kind of like rustic little outdoor school for a couple of days, you know, good on him. 
an Aerosmith soundtrack to the Black Cauldron might have also been a, a nice improvement. Would it be seventies or eighties or nineties Aerosmith? Which Aerosmith do you want to put on? On which? How the Bad Boys of Boston take care of the Black Cauldron? <laughs> I mean, if I could pick, it would probably be '90s Aerosmith soundtrack. But uh, honestly, any any of those uh, genres would have been fine for this one. Jaded Not that I didn't over. like the music. The music was actually really great. It just I don't know. There was so much missing from it. It just felt like such a disappointment as to how cool I wanted it to be up until it ended. I was still like, maybe it's gonna like turn it around and really make me fall in love with it. Because again, I love the characters. I love the animation. Um, the the voices, except for Gurgi. Uh, I like I I fell in love with everything about this movie except for the movie itself. I wonder in uh, Disney Plus if you're listening. I wonder if I a, a, just a straight re-edit. I mean, if they have the original elements, just completely re-edit the thing. I wonder if you could like make this into a pretty solid film. You know, now you know that the rating doesn't matter, so you can keep in whatever you need. Uh, they also cut out some character interactions. I don't know if those would help at all, but. You know, it's just kind of like Star Wars, right? You need Marsha Lucas to actually make sense of the thing. Uh, what George Lucas shot was apparently gibberish. So, well, also turning this one into like a game that could also be a a much better way to explore this deep, you know, five book series that goes into like all of this extra wealth mythology. I feel like like an interactive experience for Black Cauldron would be way more appropriate than just trying to like re edit or you know reproduce this maybe like a, a long ongoing series but then again why not just watch witcher yeah and play final fantasy games right <laughs> so zelda you can play the new zelda right here right now <laughs> Zelda, and also i mean this was one of the um this was a very very popular fantasy uh almost like dungeons and dragons -y sort of book series that got popular but uh, Harry Potter, I guess, kind of like claims that throne now in that same sort of realm. And Harry Potter game, you know, went gangbusters. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think Black Cauldron could have leaned on any of that at that time. Yeah, I, I will say within five hours of the release of the new Zelda, one of my friends has sent me a, a picture where they had uh, fashioned a sword and had put two swords together to make a sword sword. So I was like, okay, that looks fun. <laughs> Go around with your sword sword. <laughs> Apparently you can just make like insane things in, in the game and then try and fight people with them. So I don't, I don't really know how it works to be honest. <laughs> um, I do feel like we're, we're, we're in a labyrinth of, of things to talk about. So let, let me throw the ball your way and make sure we're not skipping anything major. Yeah, shoot. Have. Oh, no, I, don't, I don't have anything else big on this. Okay, then, then I, I'm that was me basically saying I think I've run out of things that I really wanted to say on here. Let me just scroll through my notes and uh, oh, I wrote my pig can tell the future is a really good uh pickup line in a in a bar or something. This is in a prison, so I guess it makes a little more sense. But yeah, if <laughs> if, if, if I weren't married, I go try that somewhere. My pig can tell the future. Um, <laughs> I love the Chronicles of Pride Day. And then, then they, <laughs> they start talking about wealth, the most mythology. And you're like, uh-oh, I'm out of my depth. <laughs> yeah, you'd be out. Or you could just say I'm a pig boy. Try that out. That'd be cool, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just, um, I do the Twilight Zone uh, podcast where we had just done the episode Still Valley, which has a, a witch man. He's not a warlock. He's not a wizard. He's a witch man. And he has like the Southern Madman accent. I'm like, oh, my God. And he has a giant black book that says witchcraft on the cover so uh, brought to you by kenneth anger really yeah <laughs> but uh yeah yeah that that was not the best twilight zone episode but you just yeah i i, I fell in love with the with the witch man so <laughs> it's so insane now that's a name for an album i fell in love with the witch man <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that's good or or another pickup line why not um <laughs> I wonder what drinking with the horned god is like. Why did I write that? Okay, that that's some that's some late night writing there. Well, again, the um, horned god would be Bacchus and Dionysus. So, what would it be like to drink with Bacchus? You know, oh, the, the, the god of drinking. That's you're gonna die of alcohol. It would, it would probably uh, it, it would probably uh, you know, blur some lines for you for sure. Oh, here we go. When they get the cauldron, this is just making stupid observations at the end here. Um, if the ghoul eat the apple core then the deal is set because they're like oh i'll give you the apple core it's a joke right like of course you can't trade the apple core but then then they eat the apple core i'm like oh you made the deal so little plot hole 
<laughs> it doesn't matter if it's stupid. If you do it, you made the deal. That's that's how I see it, at least. <laughs> In the military, I know someone that ate the entire apple, core and all, which I, I honestly think is not supposed to be great for you because there's arsenic in the apple seeds but my my wife will eat the tail on a fried uh, shrimp which i don't know i guess some and then and then my dad was visiting so he was like oh i'm gonna do that too but then we were having sushi and do it with the sushi and then my wife was like a gas like no don't do it with the sushi yeah. <laughs> so apparently if it's fried shrimp you can eat the tail if you want to but i don't see why you'd want to so I don't know. I, I can challenge. You can take on that challenge next time you have fried shrimp if, if, you, if you like that sort of thing. I have seen someone eat crawfish with the entire shell intact and just yeah. crunch away at it. There's, I, I have had a soft shell crab before, so I guess that wasn't so bad. I mean, again, I li- where I live, you can eat bee larva and, and locust with soy, soy covered locust, which I've had. So <laughs> you're selling it. Yeah. Ch- Chernobog ride followed by some some locusts. Sounds awesome. <laughs> oh yeah, they should have given you that on the way out. That, that's actually <laughs> on the way out. That's actually a Nagano specialty. So you you have to go up in the mountains to to eat some locusts. Yeah, <laughs> but because because of the bee larva, I've not tried the bee larva. Um, I mean, I'd try at least once, I guess. But we do have a bunch of like big metal bee statues. Like there's like three of them within probably a ten minute drive of my house. So it's kind of weird when you're rolling up the street and there's a big metal bee statue. You know, like fifteen feet tall or something. So maybe ten feet tall. But uh, is that from when you... Riza Riza came through? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Killer bees. No, yeah, that's that, Japanese that... killer bees. No, it's because of, it's the regional food. Uh, in Japan, uh, everywhere is like wh- it's like what is your area known for like your area is supposed to be known for some food Mm. specialty so nagano we have uh oyaki which are kind of like doughy things with pumpkin or or mountain vegetables inside and and uh you know the soba here is pretty good and we got the bee larva and the locust oh and horse meat you can eat horse uh raw horse or horse in your udon noodles yeah he just mix that all together you can have a meal with all of them one bowl yeah you have a meal with all of them for sure (laughs) <laughs> um, no, if you stay at a Japanese in a Nagano, they're going to serve you the raw horse meat, which with a little wasabi on it, it's really actually quite good. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give thumbs up to the horse meat, uh, which sounds horrible when you say it, but <laughs> they eat horses, don't they? Uh, <laughs> I am a picky eater, weirdly enough, but it, sometimes it's weird what I will eat. So uh, my wife's always surprised when I'm like always ordering fried oysters because I don't like fishy stuff usually, but I like fried oysters. So. Yeah, my my tastes make no sense whatsoever. <laughs> well, when you deep fry something, it stops being the thing and starts just being fried. Yeah, you can deep fry anything. That's right. Um, you can deep fry whale sperm, which I also had. <laughs> I didn't know what it was. This needs to be I a reoccurring it. theme: is that we just always have to figure out a way to work in that you've eaten whale sperm. Yeah, I, that, that's episode. a that's I, that's a five timer for uh, none this another podcast for <laughs> sure. Uh, <laughs> It's just like, I actually didn't, here's the thing. I didn't know about it till like several weeks later. Cause a few of the other, uh, my coworkers learned right then and there, but they, didn't, they, I didn't learn until several weeks later. So it's like, Oh, that thing really, no way. Okay. <laughs> so there was a, there was a long delay in learn in, in the learning there. Um, I guess we'll, we'll close up shop. We will, we will cut the fire of the cauldron. We'll stick our head in the cauldron, see into the future. What's in your future? We'll have to cut off the supply of whale sperm for, yeah, for this one. That's right. Uh, and this feature, so I've actually just put out a, um, well, I'm about to put out the sequel to my Paranoid Pamphlet series. So the first one was the MK Ultra that you can get at mkultracomic.com. But the second one I made with, uh, with Juan, who I think we have a mutual friend in, and it's called the Homunculus Owner's Guide. And it's a 40-page pamphlet that describes how you can create and take care of your homunculus and also all the magical powers and abilities that a homunculus can give you once you kill it and use the skin of its forehead or its blood or its ashes and a number of different concoctions and it's all based on you know old alchemical texts none of this is just stuff that we we you know thought up out of nowhere it is a non-fiction reference pamphlet just like the the mk ultra one is but it's on the concept of homunculi so yeah you can check for that one on paranoidamerican.com also homunculusbook.com which is going to have like a preview of that and maybe some some more details uh in the background of it all so yeah that that's the big one that i've been working on and i'm really excited to bring that one out soon 
Do you just get one for yourself, or do you do you get like forty and hand them out at street corners? <laughs> Amunka, I mean, funny enough, there was actually a, a German count that is still in the Guinness Book of World Records today. Um, with having the largest homunculus on record, but he had like seven or eight different homunculi for different purposes. He kept them little glass vials in the dark. But yeah, to, to answer your question, most of the time you would have a multitude of homunculi. You would probably just handle one at a time. Uh, but over the course of your life, you'd probably make dozens of them at least. You'd have a nose because the, made of the ultimate goal steel. is that you have to kill it. You have to kill it and then use its remains to do something with right um have you seen the movie freddy got fingered oh yeah Where i'm wondering that? if when he he gets inside the deer if he's kind of trying to you know do some homunculus style magic where he's it's the deer on the road and then and then gorily rips it apart and starts wearing it around as a as a cape i always figured that was a uh, star wars reference yeah, now I'm one, now I'm thinking of homunculus though. With that, I mean, I, I don't know if that's a method you would use for making one, but uh... <laughs> uh, well, one of the, the methods is that you do and you impregnate a cow with uh, whatever you know you want, and then you feed it the blood of a ewe uh, for like a week or something, and then you uh, you seal the cow like you stitch all of its orifices closed, and you wait for it to die. And there's lots of like burying things and uncovering them later. Again, if you if you want to know the the full background and recipe and how to take care of it, the Homunculus Orders Guide. It's got it's the only book I know that will be in existence, which uh, which illustrates in graphic detail exactly what you would do to create a homunculus. It sounds like too much work. I mean, not reading the book, but making the homunculus. I, I can't be bothered to build an Enterprise C model that's still in my closet here. <laughs> well, you'll be happy to know that that depending on how well the pamphlet does, we might come out with a homunculus growers kit where you just <laughs> order and a box just shows up and it's like, you know, three steps. Put this into this thing and seal it with this thing and put it in a closet and come back and you've got a homunculus. All right. <laughs> Um, as for this, it's the Occult Disney Podcast. It's Occult Disney Pod on Twitter. Um, I do kind of thumb through my Twitter, so if if you were to contact, that's probably the best place to do it. Uh, you can support us on Patreon at Podcastio Podcastius, where we do a lot of podcasts. The aforementioned Twilight Zone podcast is Time Enough podcast. We talk about the 100 best and the 100 worst films as rated on IMDb on Films and Filth, the Citizen Kane of podcasting. Uh, this week, I, I think, is our Human Centipede 2 episode. If, if Speaking of things you need to have a, a cast iron stomach and or nose for. And there's some video game stuff. Uh, you can actually hear people who are not me go into great depth about Zelda on the Hyrule Field Report. You can hear about Pokemon, Luke loves Pokemon, and you can hear gamers gaming themselves with gaming questions on the Game Game Show. I just try and say game as many times as I can that last little You can talk about the Sword Sword and the Game Game Show? Yeah, the Sword Sword and the Game Game Show, that's right. (laughs) (laughs) Repeated words. Hey, there is something, repetition, right? Yeah, say something three times and it's going to appear behind you. (laughs) It's a classic uh, rhetoric skill, so yeah. Say the... You say Lotso Bear three times, he's he's right behind you. Bloody Mary. <laughs> no, I lot Lotso's there because uh, the toy uh, I well will probably do a Toy Story three podcast at some point, but I'm doing one next week as well. So I made sure to put Lotso in, in place now for that. Don't want to forget later. Okay. Let's get uh let's let's get making an army of the undead then. Got some work to do.